Hi, welcome to part seven on our segment related to Art Nouveau, Fauvism, and Expressionism. Um, in our last segment, we started talking about Expressionism, and we had looked at the work of Kirchner, um, an Expressionist artist. Um, just to kind of review a little bit, um, Expressionism was inspired by the Fauve movement in Paris. Um, a group of German artists in Dresden gathered around Kirchner and formed the Die Brücke, the bridge, um, in 1905. Uh, and this was named the bridge because they really saw themselves as a bridge from sort of these traditional styles of painting to a, a more modern mode of painting. Um, they emphasized the same fall of ideas um, expressed in violent juxtaposition of color, so really bright, um, vivid colors, you know, unusual color combinations. Um, was, was one of their conventions that they adopted. So we're going to continue with Expressionism, and we're going to be looking at an, art, an artist named Wallacey um, Kadinsky, who um, is a Russian artist. Um, he um, created a second expressionist, expressionistic group called um, uh, De Blue Right. I'm not saying it right in German, but it translates the Blue Writer. Um, this was formed in Munich, Germany in 1911, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about um, um, what their manifesto was in a second. But um, So there are two um, distinct groups that you have to remember, um, the Bridge and the Blue Rider. And Kirchner um, is associated with the Bridge, and the artist um, Wallacey Kandinsky is um, associated with the Blue Rider group. So in addition to being um, a painter, um, he also was a theorist, um, and he wrote um, books about art theory as well. And he really wanted to move the mode of painting um, in, into something called synesthesia, where art um, wasn't just visual, but it could cross the senses. We saw this a little bit um, in the symbolist movement. Um, when we looked at the work of Gauguin, but this idea that, you know, you can hear a painting, um, you can um, see music, and so he was very much um, intrigued by this notion. He is also credited as being one of the um, first abstract um, painters. Um, his works, when you initially look at them, look abstract, but they're not um, purely abstract. They're abstracted. If you start to look closely um, at some of his compositions, um, you do you can start to make out um, um, recognizable forms. Like here in the background, it looks like there's a church or some buildings. Um, here's a wave, and this is intentional. So he's sort of, um, you know, he's really um, a, a pioneer in, in terms of um, bringing in this movement of what will be abstract expressionist art um, later. Um, but, you know, again, he's, 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 his paintings are more abstracted and not purely abstract. So I want you guys to take a moment and really study the painting. Um, maybe look um, and see if you can see any sort of recognizable forms. And we'll, we'll go back and talk about this later. To understand the work of Kandinsky, we're going to look at some of his earlier work. Um, and we're going to look at um, probably one of his most important paintings from the first decade of the 1900s. Um, and this is called um, The Blue Rider. It was done in 1903. It shows a small cloaked figure on a speeding horse rushing through a rocky meadow. Um, the rider's cloak is a medium blue, which casts a darker blue shadow. In the foreground are more sort of um, amorphous blue shadows. Um, they're sort of ambiguous. Um, the counterparts of um, the fall trees in the background. Um, and the, the blue rider in the painting is, is prominent, but he's not clearly defined. And, and so I think when you look at this image and you look at the brushwork, he definitely was looking at Impressionism um, painters and I think was inspired um, by that movement. Um, and so this is his early work. Um, and it really does um, take quite a leap um, as, he be, as he becomes more of a um, mature um, artist. And I wanted to show you this painting, too, because he, he seemed to have this affinity um, for 
horses and this idea of um, the horse rider. We'll see it um, in his later, more abstracted works. Um, in addition, he, he was very much interested in biblical imagery um, as, as well as um, um, the, the horsemen uh, of the apocalypse as well. And so when we look at this um, early painting by Kandinsky, um, you know, this sort of um, loose brushwork and the, the sort of, um, you know, we see the writer being more suggested through color, um, we do start to see um, how, um, you know, what direction Kandinsky is, was going to take in the next few years in terms of color and, and really breaking down um, his composition into basic um, forms and, and you know really talking about formal composition, line, shape, color, and those really being the focus and actually the subject matter as opposed to something like you know a person riding a horse or a landscape. Um, what you're looking at is a cover um, that um, um, Kandinsky created for um, the, the, the writer Almanac. Um, again, Kandinsky and several other artists um, formed this group in response to the rejection of Kandinsky's painting Last Judgment from an exhibition. And so again, we sort of see this idea of, um, like many artistic movements we've observed, um, you know, this reaction against these sort of academic and traditional um, art standards and, and trying to um, go against um, the traditional. And so um, this is the painting, The Last Judgment, that had been rejected. I just wanted to give you a glimpse of it. So the Blue Rider did not have a, a direct manifesto um, within the group. There were various artistic approaches and aims that varied from artist to artist. Um, however, the artists shared a common desire to express spiritual truth um, through their art. They believed in the promotion of modern art, the connection between visual art and music in particular, the spiritual and symbolic associations of color, and spontaneous intuitive um, approaches to painting. Uh, members were also interested in European medieval art and um, primi primitivism. Um, we, we talked about that um, word um, when we looked at the work of Anne um, of Kirchner, and this was sort of... Um, people sort of looking at um, art of non-Western cultures as primitive and simple and, and more natural and sort of trying to incorporate some of those conventions into their work. And, um, you know, and, and the subject matter varied as well. Um, what we'll see happening too as a result, uh, other movements um, start to um, emerge as well and some artists encounter um, other really famous movements that we'll be talking about. Cubist um, is something we haven't talked about yet with Picasso. Um, we did talk about the, the Fauvist movement. And so, um, so there's lots of interaction and this exchange of ideas. Um, the Blue Rider organized exhibitions in 1911 and 1912 that toured Germany. They also published an almanac um, featuring a contemporary primitive and featuring contemporary primitive um, and folk art, along with children's paintings. The group was disrupted um, by the outbreak of the First World War in 1914. Some of the artists, um, you know, had to fight in the war, were killed in combat. Um, Franz Marc um, is a famous artist, and he was killed during World War I. And um, um, Volosy Kandinsky was actually forced to move back to Russia because of their Russian citizenship. Um, there was also difference in opinions within the group, and as a result, the Blue Rider was short-lived, only lasting three years from 1911 to 1914, and then eventually was disbanded. So when we look at um, the work of Kandinsky um, from his later period, we really see that he was interested in um, very um, expressive colored masses, um, and really an emphasis on shape and line uh, as being um, the subject matter. Music was also very important um, to the birth of this sort of abstracted style of art. 
um, since music is abstract by nature. It does not try to represent the exterior world, um, but express it in an immediate way um, that inner, you know, the sort of inner feelings of the soul. And that's what really Kandinsky was interested in. And if you can look at the title, Improvisation 27, um, we see that Kandinsky sometimes used musical terms to identify his works. Um, he called his um, most spontaneous paintings improvisations and described more elaborate works as compositions. And so these are sort of the notations that um, musical composers um, would use. And so we really do see this um, infusion of music um, and art and sort of the merging of the two. Here are some quotes um, from Kandinsky. And again, he, he wrote, in addition to making art, he wrote a, a lot about art um, and art theory. Um, he, he really wanted art to be spiritual. Um, and so this is a quote about color. Um, and so this is in a, in a book he wrote concerning the spiritual and art that um, he did in 1911. Color directly influences the soul. Color is the keyboard. The eyes are the hammers. The soul is the piano with so many strings. The artist is the hand that plays, touching one key or another purposefully to cause vibrations in the soul. And that's really what he wanted art to do. He wanted people to have that sensation as well. Um, here is some more insight into this idea of the titles and improvisation. Um, and it's the practice of acting, singing, talking, and reacting, or making and creating in the moment and in response to the stimulus of one's immediate environment and inner feelings. This can result in the invention of new thought patterns, new practices, new structures or symbols, and or new ways to act. This invention cycle occurs most effectively when the practitioner has a thorough intuitive and technical understanding of the necessary skills and concerns within the improvised domain. Improvisation can be thought of as an on-the-spot or on-the-cuff spontaneous activity. So we're going to look at um, some more of Kandinsky's paintings. Historians have observed how Kandinsky's thematic concerns shifted from portrayals of na natural events to these very apocalyptic narratives. Um, and so apocalyptic means sort of the end of the world. By 1910, many of the artist's abstract canvases shared a common literary source, and this was the revelation of St. John the Divine. The writer came to signify the horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, who would bring epic destruction after which the world would be redeemed. And so he really, it might not look like it at first when you look initially, but a lot of these compositions um, have this biblical theme. In both um, sketch um, for composition two, which you see up here in the left top corner, and um, improvisation 28, which we just looked at on the bottom, we can really see how Kandinsky um, depicted through these kind of abstracted memes this cataclysmic event um, on one side of the canvas and this, this idea of paradise or spiritual salvation on the other side. So we're going to take a closer look. Um, also, this just to remind you, this is, um, I wanted to reference this idea of the horsemen of the apocalypse, again, relating back to this affinity that apparently um, Kandinsky had two horses and riders. Um, this is a wood, um, an et no, this is a woodcut. I'm sorry, this is a woodcut by Albert Durer. Remember, he was um, a North Renaissance um, painter and printmaker. So I asked you earlier to really take a good look and see if you could, um, you know, make out some recognizable um, elements um, in um, Kandinsky's composition. Again, this isn't it's not purely abstracted. There are still some sort of recognizable forms, and I'm going to have to use my magnifying glass. So in, in the top right-hand corner right here, um, if you look closely, it really does look like a mountain, perhaps, with um, a, a, a buildings, maybe a church. Um, some historians think that's, that this might be... Um, you know, Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, and this sort of allusion to paradise. And if we kind of look further down, 
I don't know if you can make this out, but to me, and I, and other historians have pointed this out, this looks like a couple um, kissing or embracing, again, these sort of allusions to um, paradise and um, serenity. And let me see if we can um, look at some other elements of the painting. In the lower left-hand corner, this is supposed to um, be a wave, okay? Um, and this is supposed to symbolize the great wave. Um, and, and this is symbolizing this idea of a flood myth or a deluge myth, um, which is a narrative in which a great flood, usually sent by a deity or deities, destroys civilization and, and, and then often in an act of divine retribution. And so I think you can really sort of see this idea of these waves, and it really does fit in with Kandinsky's idea of um, this, you know, that these biblical ideas of, of sort of retribution and redemption, in particular with the with the reference of the horse of the apocalypse. Um, here, some historians have pointed out these waves, some in these patches of blues. Um, these sort of diagonal lines have been interpreted as canon. So you have um, this, you know, this is the side where you see destruction um, and corruption happening. And then on the other side, you have this idea of paradise. And so by looking at one of Kandinsky's paintings, it really shows us this idea of how we, we need to slow down when we look at art. You know, as a society, we're trained to kind of especially when we go visit a museum to kind of look at something for a few seconds and move on. And, and art really isn't about that. It, it really is meant to sort of be, con, you know, to contemplate, to be thoughtful, to take your time looking. And I think the more you are patient and look at this painting, you really can start to make out um, these very expressive, slight, you know, very abstracted um, um, subjects and sort of recognizable um, elements of the real world. Um, so the use of the horse and rider motif um, symbolized um, Kandinsky's crusade against the conventional aesthetic value and his dream of a better, more spiritual future through the transformative powers of art. So again, like this sort of retribution of a wave, sort of um, you know, destroying everything, this idea of destroying these older, you know, academic traditions, and then, you know, paving the, the slate clean for a new start, and this idea of redemption. The horseman in particular um, is a symbol of the apocalypse, but also redemption for a new start, and we see how um, Kandinsky has um, explored that. We see it here. Um, in this variation of the horse. We saw it in his earlier work, and so it, it really does have a powerful presence and is a very um, important motif in his work. So um, I do want to briefly um, get back to this notion of music because um, it is very, it, it is a very important element in his work, and I forgot to mention some things. But again, I mentioned this idea of synesthesia and this idea of the crossing of the senses. And so um, you know, when we look at the title of this painting, it, it really is more unusual than some of the others that we've seen. Again, he's really associating this idea of music because improvisation, composition, these are notations that composers might use. And so why would Kandinsky do that? And so he really is trying to compare a painting to music. Um, and, and again, it, it relates to this idea of synthesis or this crossing of senses where you can hear a painting or see music. And Kandinsky was very influenced by a composer named Arnold um, Schromberg. And um, he was doing something where he was sort of jettisoning familiar Western harmonies to create a more difficult style of music. And he referred to this musical style as atonal. And so that's what Kandinsky appears to be doing in a lot of his um, abstract work, that he's, he's trying to sort of ask the question, what would a painting sound like? Um, and, um, and then, you know, that he's, he's, he's making these atonal paintings. So it's, it's something very different and it's just a different way of thinking and really looking about art. Um, and this really does pave the way, um, for, um, later 20th century art movements. So, um, that's the end of our video on 
Art Nouveau, Fauvism, and Expressionism. And as usual, please try to look at the Khan Academy videos. There is one on Improvisation 28 that is very good and, and worth watching. And um, so stay tuned. Um, we'll be moving further into the 20th century.